I didn't say that those things aren't no, true. No, I know you didn't. I know you didn't. But there I, are I, people. No, 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 I understand exactly what you said. So that there's no question that the vast majority of hardcore substance users had that trajectory that I described, okay? Now, as you say, there are some people that you look at and they didn't have those particular hardships. However, uh, what you do find, and I've dealt with many of these people as well in my practice as a physician, in those families, while there may not have been overt trauma or abuse, there was always some significant emotional loss, stress on the parents that particularly affected the development of a sensitive child. And that begins already in uterus. You can stress women when they're pregnant or animals and predict that their children will be more likely to have dysfunctions later on. Because already the, the development starts happening. There's a study after 9-11 that looked at women who were pregnant at the time and suffered PTSD as a result of the World Trade disaster. At one year of age, depending on which stage of pregnancy, the woman suffered the post-traumatic stress disorder. At one year of age, those children had abnormal stress hormone levels. Now, high stress hormone levels are a risk for a factor for addiction because addiction is one way of regulating stress. So, in no case that I've ever looked at of an addict, of any kind of addict, to anything, whether it's in fact substances or behaviors or, 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 or illegal or illegal uh, drugs, did I find that they had that emotional support that healthy development requires. Now, they, you know, and, and, and I speak as a parent as well and as a workaholic father, as a workaholic physician, I know the kind of emotional losses my children experienced because I wasn't around for them. Now, they weren't abused, there was no trauma, but there was a lack of something that they needed. And so, in, secondly, first, secondly, then those children that are not well connected to adults tend to connect heavily with the peer group. And so, the, they may not have been abused, but once they get connected to the peer group, according to the research literature, they're much more likely to start using drugs. And there's another book I've co-written on, on, on the influence on the peer group on child development called Hold On To Your Kids. So that, in short, I don't agree that these people didn't suffer losses. They just may not have suffered the degree of loss that the bulk of substance-using addicts have suffered. And finally, this issue of choice. It's a question of how I understand human beings. Yes. On the trivial level, on the surface level, there's a choice. I'm going to put a needle into my arm. It's a choice you're making. But what's driving that choice? People aren't aware of. People are not aware of their unconscious mechanisms, which are mostly responsible for the decisions that they make. And, and furthermore, not everybody who uses the drug will be addicted. Most people who try heroin will not be addicted to it. Most people who try cocaine, alcohol, tobacco, cigarettes will not become addicted. So, in some people who use that stuff, if there's a susceptibility there, then that the drug and the susceptibility will then lead to the addiction. So, this issue of choice, I don't agree that, that people make, and, and people don't make a free choice to be an addict. They may choose to try something at one time, but they don't choose to be an addict. Nobody does. And finally, the people that choose later on to give up their addiction, that's true, they do. But usually when you look at them, that's because they've had some support in their lives. They've had some compassionate support. As I quoted earlier, only in the presence of compassion will people allow themselves to see the truth. So the people that successfully make it are usually the ones who found some program or some individual in their life or some other support who could compassionately accompany them on their journey. So it still wasn't just a matter of their own individual strength. It took a lot of strength individually, but it was still based on that biopsychosocial model of, of support. So, it, it, it was, with those comments, I would respond to yours. The last thing you said is certainly true. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bank. Um, Senator Kanya. Same coming through. We've heard a lot of witnesses of all kinds, people who treat drug addictions, people who are in the legal system, um, people who are in the corrections uh, system, people who are involved uh, at various levels of the legal system, and they have different lenses when they look at the problem. They have different visions. And I think we here are facing a very complex problem, 
And when a problem is complex, the solutions invariably are complex as well, depending on the context and the environment. Just like Senator Banks did, I wish to thank you and congratulate you for the quality of the work you do. The challenge is great in the work you do with the people facing this terrible, I wouldn't say disease, because we're going to take into account the theories you put forward, but uh, dependence, dependency, and thank you for all your work in this area. My question relates more to comments that you have made. You stated that there's no proof that There's no proof, as I was saying, that putting people in prison reduces the crime rate. The bill we have here, as the Minister of Justice explained, is one tool in the toolbox to try to resolve drug addiction issues. You are a tool, an extraordinary tool, as a matter of fact in this challenge with drug addictions, but there are other tools that must be used, and this one targets drug trafficking in particular. And my question is this. Given that this targets trafficking, and not necessarily addicts per se, at some point in time in the lives of these people, there was access to a drug, because beyond the biological process, there was access to drugs. So if we target drug trafficking, and if we reduce access to drugs, do you not believe that the people you treat, who were young at one time and who had easy access at some point to drugs, they, they fell into, into the world of drugs because of the facility with which drugs were available beyond the biological, psychological, family issues, etc. Do you not think that in reducing access, in targeting trafficking itself, through one of the tools we will be able to combat the drug problem? But I agree, it isn't the only tool. Is that not some way of attacking the problem? Senator, for your question, and um, 